Before my five minutes starts, could I ask unanimous consent that I enter a statement into the record and that I ask on behalf of all mem members that if they want to enter a statement into the record, uh, that they can. And just remind members, uh, in 2005, when Senator Kennedy and I passed PAPA, it was with this day in mind that we would be faced with a pandemic and we're close to that determination. And I would only say the temptations to do legislation are great. Before you do it, read what the statute says. Read what the latitude is that our responders have. Let them do their jobs. Dr. Hahn expressed that he just did two emergency okay. use authorization. That's part of the work of this committee. Uh, so let's not be too quick to go out and encumber them okay. with micromanaging what they do. So ordered. The we'll, we'll go ahead and Thank make you, unanimous Mr. consent to put that in and look forward to reading it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Shook, um, I heard you say that you're rapidly trying to reach testing. Now, as of March the 1st, CDC's website had uh, total tested up on their website. It was 472, even though Secretary Azar said last night 3,600. I don't know which one's right. My, what I'm curious about is why on March the 2nd did you take the total number tested off the CDC website? Um, thank you for that question. Let me clarify. Um, there's a lot of numbers out there. Um, there's a difference between uh, persons under investigation who have been tested and all of the tests that we have run. For instance, an individual case, the first 12 cases that we saw here, we did serial testing on them to understand how long the virus was present and when it was safe for them to leave the hospital or when they no longer needed isolation. We collected multiple specimens, so we understood with this very new virus, is it the upper respiratory or the lower respiratory? We've also collected other, other specimens from them. So the over 3,000 tests run is correct. We've tested way more than um, the 500-some persons under investigation. We've also tested some of the hot cohorts or the hot-risk cohorts Shepard, like the repatriation individuals from the Diamond Princess. We've known about Princess. this potential threat mm -hmm. since uh, uh, early January, if mm -hmm. not in December with what we're looking back at now. Um, diagnostics had to have been one of the things that we were looking at saying we've got to be able to do this. And we devote uh, through PAPA $150 million each year to strengthen the surveillance capabilities at the state level. How can we have a situation like Washington State where we've known for up to six weeks um, reaching possibly 1,500 individuals, yet we experienced what we have with this long-term care facility and clearly a cluster that we don't know the magnitude of. How can that happen when we've invested so much in, in being there early on and understanding it and being prepared? CDC very rapidly developed a new PCR for a completely new virus. We posted the instructions for that PCR on the website so other labs, academic labs, commercial labs, research labs, could similarly develop tests. BARDA has the responsibility to work with the private sector to get commercial labs up and running. And the CDC has supplied the public health labs with the ability to do the testing. The situation in Washington state is tragic. An outbreak in a long-term care facility is one of the things we have been worried about from day one. We learned from the SARS experience in 2003 that super spreading events or super spreading individuals could cause very large amplification rapidly. And, and so the concern about healthcare settings has been foremo foremost in our mind. Dr. Shukit, I believe you. I, I'm only looking at were we better prepared for this happening, and it doesn't seem to be that we were. Now, Papa also in the reauthorization provided direct hiring authority for 30 new employees at CDC dedicated to development of a biosurveillance system at CDC. Of those 30 slots, how many have you filled? I don't have that information, but I can tell you that the laboratory activities for the coronavirus are not one of the larger parts of our program. We have a really built our response around our influenza capacity, which is um, really um, grown with the generosity of the American people through Congress. So our coronavirus capacity is relatively small. We built it up a little bit after MERS, but we're not able to sustain that. So we really appreciate the support from Congress to strengthen that public health infrastructure, both at CDC and at the states. I, was, I, I personally was shocked, and, and I like to think that I'm 
fairly knowledgeable of everything that we instruct and provide for agencies. I was shocked to find out that in the normal appropriations, this $150 million, that that can also be used for CDC facility construction. It, you know, it's a little misleading to say this went for surveillance when the flexibility exists for some of it to go for facility construction. Do you know what portion of the 150 did not go directly to fund surveillance? I'm not sure what the 150 million line is. I think I'm going to need to get back to you on that. Our, um, uh, our uh, construction renovation appropriations are separate, so I, I will need to get back to you on that. Yeah, I think if you'll check the appropriations, in all appropriations go to CDC, there's a, a, an, a, an ability to move money from that to construction facilities, and I would encourage the appropriators on this committee, especially as we look at the emergency funding. For God's sakes, let's make sure it goes to response and not construction of a campus uh, at, at this time. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Burr. Did you have something else, uh, Senator Burr? No, just we'll follow up.